Hey dojo friends, I had several questions about the armor of the samurai, the yoroi or the gunsoku. And people asked last night in black belt class, we were working on uh, kosotogake, o sotogake, ko uchigari, o uchigari, all these different takedowns and leg throws. And they were asking, well, how is it different from judo versus wearing armor? In other words, were these throws the same in the old days as they were now? No. They couldn't have been because of the way the clothing was designed. The old yoroi, the heavier plate armor, made some of these leg takedowns and kind of judo takedowns nearly impossible. Of course, we weren't there in history to know exactly how these things were documented, if at all, but I have a strong suspicion in wearing many types of armor over the years that some of these leg locks or throws would have been very, very different on a slippery battlefield. You have to remember that there are different stages of armor. There are three. You have the classical armor and the newer armor that's more flexible and able to move. There's entire periods of history like the Sengoku where they were in battles all the time and they were on horseback. So the armor had to be different. The Haidate had to be different. Some pieces of armor were left off in the Edo period in modern times so that you could move more when horses weren't around. And you didn't have large like Naginata halberds or spears or bow and arrow anymore. You had smaller swords, shorter swords. So talking about armor opens up an entire rabbit hole, a can of worms that you could go down for many, many hours in studying the different types in different periods of time. So I wanted to show you today the sangu. The sangu is the type of armor that covers the extremities like the kote, the haidate, suniata, things like that. The things that protect your legs and arms. We're not necessarily talking about the do, the breastplate, or the helmet today. I want to show you how it's possible that these shin guards might have impeded some of these judo type throws. Now this armor needs some work. It needs to be dusted and redressed, so to speak. I haven't done it in many, many, many months and it gets kind of messy from here at the dojo, moving around and shifting it and things like that. Starting from the waist down, you have the obi belt, but this obi belt, this thick one here, was actually worn under the armor. In display, you put it over but this is pre preventing this dole, this plate, from cutting into you if you're sitting on a horse. And this is like a pad that would sit on your waist and your stomach, etc., to keep this from cutting into you. So these thick obi, people don't know, were actually worn under the armor. Now you may have a separate obi wrap around the outside that was thin, much longer, that you could keep your swords tucked into. But these thick obi belts are under the armor that you don't see Again, for displaying them, we keep them on the outside because they're really cool and decorative. I'm not going to talk about these kusazuri, these tassets that sit here, or I'm not also going to talk about the haidate, which are these thigh guards here that kind of came much later. These thigh guards were really good for horseback riding, so if you were hit by arrows or something, they would protect your thighs. What I wanted to look at today are these greaves. There are two types of greaves. You have shino, which are split armored, which sometimes you'll see pieces of iron or leather. These are the metal plates. They're called one piece subo suneate. Suneate is the shin guard here. What I love about this, as you can see from the side, is it has a point here. These were designed to have an edge. Many of them, they had rivets and things, things that stuck out. So if you're kicking the opponent, this shin here would cause more damage onto their armor or onto their legs. I love the design of that. Very uncomfortable to wear. That's why many times they had leather in here or different types of material to protect yourself. Some of the higher end armor had these knee pads. These are polines or hiza yoroi or tateage. Tateage, these kind of knee pads and some are on the inside, some are on the outside all different shapes and sizes to protect your knee but sometimes the armor did not have that they would just have the greaves here now people always ask too in the same breath well what did they wear under the armor was it just underwear were they naked well in the old yoroi case hita tare is the undergarment here is a character of this traditional undergarment of the samurai you had the shitage juban which is the undershirt here the hakamashita, which is the top, we call these kind of kimono here. You would have an obi belt of some sort. Tatsuke bakama, or hakama, we call these, these pant legs. 
In this case, they're tucked into the kahan, which are these leggings down here. And then sometimes they would wear tabby socks or warajigake, which are these straw sandals. I don't have any right now. A lot of the times these straw, rice straw sandals were very common if you didn't have to worry about protecting the top of your foot. We discussed that in class as well with certain types of foot stomps that we do. It was designed to break the bones up here. If you're just wearing these sandals, I don't have a picture, but I'll put one up of the common sandals. You could do a lot of damage if you were stomping. But they'd sometimes had higher quality shoes, so to speak, armored shoes, which were called kegutsu. Kegutsu are samurai shoes that might have been covered with bear fur or sometimes horse hair. You had the tabby socks, and then you had the kogate the foot armor or the Kagutsi samurai shoes, one of the two. Kogate was more of a solid piece of foot armor that you might have worn if you were on horseback or going into heavier battle. What I love about armor is context matters. Context is everything and you have to break things down into the period of history you're talking about or the entire wardrobe changes what they wore underneath changes, the type of armor changes, were you on horseback, what type of battle was it, how much money did the person have, what was given to you by the military, were you a foot soldier, were you on horseback, were you in the archery department, were you in the spear department, were you the leaders that had all the adornments and things like that. All of these things affected the martial arts, if any, that you could use underneath the armor. If you were lucky enough to be able to ford one of these greaves, these suneate, you would untie these, put it on your shin bone here, and it would protect you from shin kicks, from getting hit by a staff or a spear, and then you would have the knee up here to protect your hiza, your knee, to guard this from different types of strikes. I have lateral shin kicked people with these, and they will destroy anyone's leg that's in front of it because of the angle and all of these little nubs that stick out. Everything has an edge to it, protected in here, but as nasty as the designer could make it out here and decorative to destroy whatever it's kicking or hitting, these are beautiful. I love the suneate here. Interesting part of the armor, interesting part of the outer armor called the sangu, the armor that protects the extremities of the samurai. I wish I had some shoes to show you, but I don't, I apologize. Um, I just don't spend money on the shoe wear of the samurai because I'm not going to wear it. I'd rather wear a nice pair of sneakers. So with these Subo Suneate, these one-piece or two-piece greaves here, I think it would be very hard to do certain types of leg sweeps, and that's what, to circle it around, we were talking about last night in black belt class, we were working on these different leg takedowns, and we were thinking, well, wouldn't these lock and hit together in combat? And I said, absolutely, they might get stuck on each other. You might get these stuck so that your legs bind together when you're trying to sweep a leg. Would you be more likely to reap the leg and lift it off the ground like a gatke, or would you pin it more like a gare, where you, you might block and hold the heel as you knock the opponent over? So many factors. It would not be smart to lift your leg off the ground if you're wearing 40 pounds of extra armor. You would fall. You have to remember that this was done on a battlefield, outdoors, when it's misty and slippery or bloody, muddy on the battlefield. Angles in the environment. Are you on a hill? Are you just jumping off your horse? What type of footwear are you wearing? Are you wearing the heavy kogate big boots or are you wearing the straw sandals that make it much easier to move? Often the straw sandals, you would have the sandal and then your, your toes would sit over the straw so that your big toe and the other toes would actually touch the ground and the sandal would sit farther back on your foot. A lot of people don't know that either. They think the sandal's way out. No, the sandal's back so that your toes can grip the ground when you're running, you get some traction. That's not to mention when you're in this kumiuchi type of grapple in the old days, you had on weapons. You couldn't get close. You had a wakizashi or a katana. You had halberds and things and spears, not to mention up top you had your helmets. You have a giant helmet with big adorned horns and things. How are you going to get close to the opponent if you have a flag on your back or a giant horn here? You're going to lock. Think of two stags fighting in the forest. They get locked together, two rams locking together. A lot of these modern judo throws are not practical for the old days. 
because nowadays we're wearing kind of pajamas all the time, soft clothing, nothing hard, it's very easy for us to get almost too athletic and too hopsy and too hoppity in to take the opponent's leg. But in the old days, I don't think many of those throws would have been used as much. You would have weighted yourself down like you do in Osoto Gake Ogari. You weigh down the opponent and then you would probably go to the ground with them as you're pulling your short sword out to dispatch of them. There were no points, there were no rules. So the idea of throwing someone and doing ukemi and getting their shoulders on the ground for a point would be unknown back then. These were times of death and warfare, quick killing, moving on to the next, multiple opponents, hundreds of people around you. Not the safeness and security of even a ring or some sort of cage match. That's why when I study the history of armor, I'm in awe in awe of the armor and what it entailed and the imagined brutality of living back then. You and I have nothing to complain about living in this century as compared to living in 15th century Japan. Our days are easy and truly blessed compared to the days of the samurai of old.